The Koenigsegg Jesko Absolute just broke the world record for going from 0 to 400 km per hour and then back to 0 again. The hypercar did it in 27.83 seconds. I let that sink in a bit, the numbers. Uh, to put them into perspective, 0 to 400 was done in 18.82 seconds. Uh, the Honda Civic Type R, which is by no means a slow car, takes more time than that to get to 200 km per hour. Now, this very record was actually taken from Koenigsegg back in May of 2023 by the Riemats Nevera, uh, which did the feat in 2993. Now, of course, Koenigsegg couldn't let that stand, so they took their Regera car to a more smooth runway, put more extreme tires on it, and reclaimed the record back to Koenigsegg just a month later, uh, and the Regera did it in 28. 81. That record stood until this week of 2024 when the Yesco did it in 2783. Uh, now, this record breaking thing really wouldn't be so special. It would be just another feat of uber expensive hypercar, uh, one upmanship, uh, I don't know, whatever. Uh, if the two previous record holders weren't so different from the Yesco. Now, the Nevera is a electric battery electric vehicle. The yes, uh, the Regera is a hybrid. The Yesco is a good old fashioned combustion only, exclusively ice powered vehicle. It has nothing other than an internal combustion engine to power its wheels. And it has the least power of the three vehicles. So how did the Yesco beat them? Well, if you have less power, uh, then you have to have less mass as well, because to accelerate faster and decelerate faster, you need to lug around less mass. And indeed, the Yesco is the lightest of the three. It is an incredible 910 kilograms lighter than the Nevera and 200 kilograms lighter than the Regera. How do you become lighter? Well, by, by getting rid of everything that you don't need. Unlike the uh, Nevera, which is a uh, four-wheel drive electric motor on each wheel um, electric battery car, the uh, Yesco has only the rear wheels driven. Uh, and also it has no clever crankshaft mounted electric motors or wheel uh, shaft mounted motors like the Regera. Uh, there are no electric turbos either. Uh, the only battery is the 12 volt battery and the, the aero is inactive. There are no clever moving wings or anything, just two fixed rigid winglets on the back of the car. Of course, it still needs massive power to achieve massive speeds, but the approach to power of the Yesco is very much simple and kind of old school too. 5 liter V8, two giant turbos, and a pretty low compression ratio for this day and age. 9 to 1. Why is it so low? So you could stuff two and a half bar of boost in the throat of each of the cylinder banks. And with E85, that's how you make 1,600 horsepower with the lightest possible flat plane V8. And that's it. Light, as much power as you get, as you can get from the simplest, lightest package. Of course, there's all the carbon, there's all the clever wheels, the clever suspension, the uber clever, tra clever transmission. But compared to other hypercars and the trends in the industry nowadays, this is really simple. The Yesco is adopting the approach of less is more, an approach that a lot of the auto industry and many other industries seems to have seem to have forgotten. You see, the Yesco had a goal. The goal was to get to a certain speed very, very quickly and then get from that speed to a stop as quickly as possible. And to achieve that, it shedded everything it didn't need and perfected everything it needed. The auto industry also has a goal. Well, at least it claims to have a goal, and that goal is the reduction of emissions, the reduction of our carbon footprint. Everybody's talking about it. So if that is our goal, to do less of something, 
Wouldn't Yesco's approach of less is more be beneficial here? Wouldn't smaller, lighter, simpler, more aerodynamic cars be better in emitting less CO2 and emissions and everything? Uh, it seems no, because as you have probably noticed, in the auto industry, the trend for the last, I don't know, two, three decades has been ever larger, ever heavier cars. The crossover trend is probably the most powerful trend in the last decade, decade and a half, where manufacturers have been turning all kinds of cars from big to small into crossovers. Vehicles with an increased ride height, size and mass but, but without any actual off-road capabilities or significantly increased interior space and with inferior aerodynamics. But people have been happily buying crossovers. Why? Honestly, I don't know. But I do know that we have been putting constantly not just making the cars bigger, but putting more and more things in them, more features, more screens, more equipment, more gizmos, more gadgets, more cameras, you name it. All of this has been making the cars heavier and more complex. Machines that spend most of their time driving a single human being to work and back have been getting bigger and bigger. So here's a question that I want to ask. Why isn't there a more simple car available? And I'm not saying this should be forced onto everyone, that everyone should own very simple cars, but why isn't it even an option? And when I say simple, I mean really simple. Extremely lightweight, no power windows, no power seats, no power mirrors, power pretty much nothing. Why? Because you have your hands and you can adjust all of that with your hands. No screens, no infotainment, no movies and apps in a car. Why? Because you're going from A to B, put your hands on the steering wheel, watch the road, you're going to use your phone when you get to your destination. No heated seats because let's just put on warmer pants. And all of this would result in a car that is that is very lightweight because there isn't much in it. And I would keep it very small. It could comfortably seat four people and that's really all you need. I would keep it small and this would make it light so it would have a car, if you get rid of all of this stuff, let's say seven to eight hundred kilograms. If you have such a lightweight car, then you can put in it a smaller less powerful engine because it's so light and you can move it around. You do not need 200 or 300 horsepower. You can do with 100 horsepower because 100 horsepower with seven to 800 kilograms is a very fun and fast enough car. Honda has proved that in the past very well. And it doesn't have to be a combustion engine. I don't care. If we put batteries in a 700 kilogram car, it's going to become a 900 kilogram car, which is still very light, which means that it needs to use less of its energy to move itself around, which means it's going to have more range, a lot more range. So why isn't a car like this available? You might say it's because small cars can't be safe. Cars have been getting bigger because of all the safety standards and making them, you know, safer for occupants because a bigger car can be made, you know, stiffer, the chassis can be made more rigid and there's more space to stuff the airbags in and whatnot. No, not true. Toyota has proven quite some time ago that you can make a very, very small car just as safe as a family car with their Toyota IQ. It had nine airbags and the same safety rating as family cars. So it can be done. Since we're speaking about safety, just a little thing. Why can't we spec our cars with the amount of safety equipment we want? Because I'm just theorizing here. This is just thinking out loud. If we can legally get on a motorcycle and travel at 100, 150 kilometers per hour, whatever is the legal speed, with the only layer of protection not being a seat belt or an airbag, but instead a layer of 
cowhide. And this is protecting us from other multi-ton vehicles in the traffic, and that is legal, but we cannot have a car that has less than nine airbags. Why can't we just spec our cars when we buy them? I say I want to have one airbag or zero airbags, and then just charge me a tiny little insurance premium. Okay, so that's just a thought on the safety equipment. Maybe it's not a good idea. Maybe it is not the point of the video. Let's get back to the point, which is the very, very simple car. Now, a very simple car would not just be lightweight. It would also be very reliable because there really isn't anything to break down on it. And maintenance would also be easy and cheap because, again, there isn't anything to break down on it. Not much to service and maintain. No crazy, faulty software updates. No crazy complicated electronics, no gadgets, no gizmos, no no glitches, none of that, because it's very, very simple. On top of this, it's of course very, very good for the envir environment, not just because it has a smaller engine or a smaller battery pack, but because it's so simple, it's, it's emitting minimal emissions during the manufacture. And when it's time for it to be recycled, it's also easy and cheap for it to be recycled because it's so simple. The, the well-to-wheel or the lifetime emissions of a vehicle like this would be undeniable, undeniably smaller than anything on existence in, in the market today. So, so why doesn't such a car exist as an option? If we want to reduce the carbon footprint, the emissions, the environmental impact, why isn't it even an option? Well, it actually was. And I had the pleasure of driving such a car for a few years. It was called the Toyota Igo. It was here in Europe, maybe in some other parts of the world. As far as I know, not in the States, but dead simple. It had a uh, it was small, you could seat four people in it over short distances. It had a one liter, uh, 64 horsepower, uh, three cylinder engine in it, which was adequate because the car weighed, the, and that's the, the, the wet weight, the curb weight, 775 kilograms. The fuel economy of this thing was, was incredible. Nothing could, I never had something that where you put the gas and you drive and drive and you drive and drive and you forget about it and then, oh, well, then you put it back again after weeks. And I drove a lot with this car over a period of four years. I did, I think around 50,000 kilometers and nothing ever broke down on it. And I mean nothing. The only cost of maintenance was a set of new tires and uh, annual oil and filter changes. That's it. Unfortunately, that car no longer exists because in 2022, Toyota decided to follow the trend of the industry and replace the Igo, which was uh, with a Igo X, which is a five centimeter higher. 23 and a half centimeter longer and 200 kilogram heavier crossover, baby crossover version of the Ico. And it has all of that, but it has, as expected, zero off-road capability. It has the same CO2 emissions as the previous generation of the Ico and it has worse performance. So why did Toyota replace the Igo with the Igo X? Was it the declining sales of the Igo? Or maybe the profit margin of the Igo was too small? Or maybe it was some sort of new environmental or safety standard or regulation? Or maybe it was because the Igo was perceived as this poor person's or girly car? Well, maybe it was all of the above. What I'm trying to say is that we're all hypocrites. The governments, the car makers, the people. There's no more use in pointing fingers because we're all in on it. The governments are making it with legislation and regulation very hard to produce uh, simple, small, lightweight cars. Japan killed pretty much all of its taxation benefits on its K car class way back in 2014. They never came back really damaged that class of very small, very low footprint of everything cars. Europe neutered its 
uh, quadricycle class, again, full of cars which are very cheap, very simple, small footprint of everything. They neutered this class by limiting the speed of these cars to 50 kilometers per hour, which makes them pretty much useless. Uh, the United States, yeah, the United States. I'm just going to put this picture of like something big. Now, uh, the car makers aren't really interested in these cars because, let's face it, the profit margin is small because you can't charge more for less. And the people also don't seem to be interested because a car like the one I described in the video, small, lightweight, simple, efficient, would be the definition of poor person's transport because it's so cheap and it doesn't have, you know, any tricks. What kind of tricks can your dog do? Nothing, but it's, you know, it's lightweight and good for my wallet and for the environment. Yeah, and that's nice, I guess. You get that fake smile that makes you feel like a loser, and that's because for the governments, for the car makers, for the people, more is more. And less is less. And until we make a genuine, honest, conscious effort of, of adopting the less is more approach to certain industries and aspects of our world, then we should really stop pretending that we're saving the world with bigger, heavier and less aerodynamic and more complicated cars. We should also stop debating, you know, whether the future is electric or hybrid or combustion or whatever. It really doesn't matter. Any kind of propulsion system or hydrogen for that matter. Any kind of propulsion system uh, is adequate as long as we make the cars smaller, simpler, lighter, and, you know, less is 